Society to the APSS Basic Spine Webinar Series 2023 program. This is the second basic webinar of the series 2023. And we look forward to an intriguing discussion on the basic surgical techniques for cervical and lumbar degenerative conditions. May I take this opportunity to welcome our Honorable President of Asia Pacific Spine Society to please welcome the delegates around and faculty. Dr. Kwan. Yeah, thank you, Vishal. <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, first of all, on behalf of the Asia Pacific Spine Society, I'd like to welcome all of you, all right, the speakers especially, and also the participants uh, to the APSS second basic spine webinars. Uh, as we know, uh, this webinar series have started two years ago during the COVID time. But due to the high demand, so the APSS ESCO have decided to continue the webinar series. For today, this is a basic webinar series that designed for the year 2023. This is the second webinar on the basic spine topics. So today's topic will be on the basic surgical techniques for cervical and lumbar degenerative spine. So we are very fortunate that we have invited very few prominent Asia Pacific speakers all right, to join this webinar. All right, they are from Singapore, Dr. Dennis He, Hong Kong, Professor Jason Chong, China, Dr. Wu, Korea, Professor Choi, who is the current president of the Korean Spine Society, Japan, very prominent, Professor Kawaguchi, India, Professor Maska Renhas. So on top of that, Dr. Ali, as well as Dr. Deka will be presented their case series for discussion. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank, especially the online educational committee of APSS, led by Dr. Vishal, for all the great work that he have done. Also thank to Kaylin and team, as well as the Auto TV. Lastly, thank you to all the participants and welcome and hope that you enjoy this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kwan. It has well, been an absolute pleasure to have you on board and we look forward to intriguing discussions for this basic spine webinar series. So as we all know, we have four basic webinars on the topic of basic spine surgery. We have four advanced spine webinars every year. And this year also, we are going to have many more in lineup. Please keep looking for these webinars on Asia Pacific Spine Society website, and also try to become members of Asia Pacific Spine Society to avail the benefits of membership of Asia Pacific Spine Society. Today, the topic is on basic surgical techniques for managing the most commonest pathologies in cervical and lumbar degenerative conditions, which include the powerhouse of lumbar fusion, transforminal lumbar interbody fusion with advanced of techniques and technology of minimal invasive. Oblique and lateral approaches for lumbar interbody fusion is going to be discussed today. And I'm sure followed by a case discussion upon complications like commonest problem of durotomy incidental happening intraoperatively, how to manage it. We have degenerative lumbar scoliosis intriguing case coming up and the jump over to the cervical scenarios in surgical techniques. The commonest surgery for cervical myelopathy, cervical laminoplasty will be brought forward and discussed in detail. Anterior cervical discectomy and fusion, the tips, techniques and strategies, patient selection will be discussed in detail. Cervical disc replacement, has it lost the sheen or is it still going to be useful in the future, will be taken in forward. A case about cervical spine will be discussed to bring the summary of the seminar today. We look forward to an interactive discussion-based webinar under the moderatorship of our moderator, Dr. Chikid and Dr. Kai Sao. Dr. Chikid, over to you to run the webinar. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bishal. Um, Jennifer, can we have the first uh, introduction for the first speaker? So, uh, without delay, we will move to uh, we will start the uh, the present uh, the webinar with the first speaker, which is uh, Dr. Dennis A on minimal invasive transforminal lumbar in the body fusion. Okay, thanks for having me. All right, today my talk is on MIST leaf. Those are my disclosures. Okay, perhaps I just start off with uh, defining a little bit of a fusion. 
Uh, I think there are two big major groups. One is postural lateral fusion, one is interbody fusion. Uh, a lot of countries, a lot of surgeons are moving towards interbody fusion. Uh, and with interbody fusion, there are three kinds, uh, posterior, the transformer, as well as the anterior. Uh, the transformer is what we're talking about today, but in the MIS way, the anterior fusion can be divided into straight anterior or laterals, of which you will see uh, terminologies like X-lift, O-lift, d lifts, but they're all lateral lifts, right? And then the last one is endolift. Endolift is not about the approach, but rather about the use of endoscope. So that is slightly different. Uh, fusion to me is a form of rigid and long-term stabilization. It removes segmental movement. Therefore, it treats movement-related problems and instability. However, it disrupts some degree of spinal mechanics for symptom relief and improved function. In a way, it is primitive because as we move on uh, to trying uh, uh, with better technology, motion preservation, this may one day in the future be phased out. Uh, it does cause higher chance of adjacent segment problems and non-union is not uncommon. And uh, I would stress that it's more important to maintain stability than, than true fusion, even though fusion is always our target, but we do know that sometimes we don't get fusion. This is a same, simple case showing a patient with a severe uh, facet arthropathy. Uh, I think the key for MISD lift is knowing uh, the facet joint anatomy first. Uh, docking is usually on the facet joint. So if you look at these three different axial cuts, to appreciate how the uh, morphology of the facet joint looks like is key to the docking of the facet and how, what you will encounter as you uh, proceed on with the surgery. Uh, the trajectory is important. It's a wheels approach. So it is par midline, uh, aiming for the facet joint. As you can see two sagittal views here, uh, one in the tangent of the end plate, the other one not in the tangent of the end plate. And it is important that you realize uh, uh, whatever you can do is determined by the, the tubular retractor. So if it is off uh, center, uh, your trajectory will be wrong and that can cause problems. So docking is one thing and the trajectory is the other thing. Just like in this particular cartoon where you can see that the trajectory is wrong and sometimes preparatory of the uh, end plates uh, can result in damage to the end plates resulting in malplacement of the cage. So we should really achieve uh, end plate uh, tra trajectory. Uh, study the axial view where the nerve root is is very important. The, how medial, how lateral the uh, traversing nerve root is, particularly in the situation of a stenosis. So it depends on how bad the stenosis, what is causing the stenosis, and where exactly the nerve root. Because this is exactly how what you encounter during the surgery as you remove the SAP. So conventional techniques use uh, multiple series of uh, dilation and then the X-ray views and then finally docking the tubular retractor. Uh, I tend to use a single shot uh, view where I, I dock on the facet joint uh, with a finger, I dilate it and then I put in straight away with my tubular retractor. That saves time and increase efficiency. So this is the, uh, the facet joint orientation that you will see. Uh, if you poorly dock, then there will be a lot of soft tissues. So try to dock as close to the facet joint as possible, uh, re removing all the soft tissues by the side, or else you have to end up resecting it. That is the facet joint, that's the joint line. Okay, So it's important for you to, again, try to visualize yourself uh, where the joint line is and orientate despite looking through a tubular retractor. And remember what I said, the uh, direction of the port determines what you would do finally as you enter. So this is the joint line. If you were dock at the, at the facet joint, you appreciate the, if you go along the joint line by resecting the SAP, preserving the IAP, whether you will hit the, the traversing nerve root or not. And I would recommend as much resection of the superior articular process as possible. That gives you a wider corridor. So feel where the pedicle is, the pedicle of the vertebra below, and then reset as much SAP as possible. These are the sequential steps. Uh, initially finding the entry point, docking it. You realize the first docking of the tube is actually not in uh, tangent to the end plate. It is readjusted. Then subsequently, the superior articular process is uh, osteotomized, like in so. And then uh, finally, uh, orientating where the traversing nerve root and exiting nerve root, uh, where the superior pedicle is, and finding your way. Then when you go deeper, you can define the, the, this space, what is superior, what is inferior. Um, do bear in mind that uh, the uh, flavor of attachment is uh, beyond the facet joint, a lot into the lamina, a lot to the lamina below. So decompression has to entail a removing of those, those flavor, if let's say those are the areas of compression. If you do over the top decompression, uh, re re remember to retilt the tube so that you can aim for the contralateral side. This is a simple uh, procedure, uh, just like how you would do a, a pure decompression surgery where you do over the top decompression looking through below the lamina on the opposite side. Uh, if you want to do ipsilateral removal of the lamina, uh, orientate yourself again and do an L cut as shape here. The next thing will be uh, the pedicle screw insertion. So some people like to do a pedicle screw insertion first and placing the wires, keeping them out of the way before doing the till lift. Uh, I tend to do the uh, fusion first with a larger incision, followed by a pedicle screw insertion. So uh, the uh, process of inserting the jump needle is quite clear cut, knowing the anatomy in three dimension. 
So the key to take note is where the pedicle is. If you can see the orange and the red, it starts uh, mark where the start of the pedicle is and the end of the pedicle is. And throughout this trajectory, it should be tied both on the AP and the lateral view. Uh, this is a sequence of x-rays. Uh, do bear in mind the guide wire is being used a lot of times, cannulated screws are being used. So uh, you will not tap all the way by cortical because that will cause the guide wire to go beyond the far cortex, uh, in increasing your chance of injuring the, uh, the uh, vessels, large vessels anteriorly. So again, a sequential step, the Jamshidi needle goes in, the tap goes in. And if let's say your, your wire is in the wrong direction, you can still try to change the trajectory uh, by uh, looking at below the, the, the two, uh, yellow uh, annotations where the guide wire is mal mal position and the tap actually goes in the correct direction but not tapped fully, uh, retracting the tap and then inserting the screw, backing out the wire before the full screw is being inserted. Those are the final images. Uh, I usually like to do uh, as long as possible strong bicortical medialized uh, um, screws. Uh, do pay in mind uh, attention that uh, uh, in MIS you don't have the luxury of a full exposure, so reduction may be difficult. It is important for you to get adequate faster joint resection on both sides if you think that uh, reduction is important. And do use the, uh, the strength of polyaxial screws uh, to be able to engage your rods and still with the uh, ability to monolize the screw, correct your deformity with an almost straight rod. This is the technique that you can use. Uh, the amount of reduction is based on the offset distance. The amount of uh, angular change is based on the alpha angle shown here. And you can use it as a monolized technique or a polyaxial technique, depending on what screws you use, either a monoaxial or polyaxial screw. So uh, in MIS leave uh, exposure is limited. So a lot of times we are worried that uh, if you get obstruction, how to overcome it. At the same time, we also worry about uh, whether amplitude preparation is sufficient, whether bone graft is sufficient. So I think these are the uh, red points where uh, issues we face, even if we do a lot of MIS theories, uh, inadequate disc preps and fusion, limited bone material for which BMP may be preferred. Uh, difficult distraction because of stiff joints, you have to release on both sides, making MIS a little bit challenging. Cage mild positioning because of the wrong trajectory of the tube. And sometimes a difficult compression of the uh, uh, screw tulips. Uh, because of the uh, intrinsic uh, disadvantage of the, the system that we use compared to open technique. So all in all, I think the take home messages for MIST leave is just a technique. I think uh, you can use different techniques on a certain condition based on uh, your uh, uh, capabilities as well as your resource, whether it allows or not your training. So now know when to use it is important. A uh, goal as MIS as would give the best outcome. So if your best outcome is an open surgery, so be it. Uh, choose your starting case as well. And if you do it slowly, usually you'll be able to pick it up. A good decompression, good stabilization is key to aim for a solid bony fusion. Know where the neural elements are so it's not avoid injuring them and uh, do an adequate release before cage placement uh, so that uh, you do not damage end plates and the construct will be uh, as strong as possible with good autosis. With that, thank you very much. Thank yeah, thank you for very much, uh, Dr. Dennis. Um, is that I'm um, okay? Um, maybe I start with some questions first. Uh, if the panel of moderate, uh, the panel has any questions, they can also ask. Okay, uh, uh, Doctor Dennis, uh, what would you, what case would you not do MIS relief? That's question one. And what case is the most ideal if for a beginner to start with? That's the second question. Yeah. Okay. Um. So so I think for a beginner, it's easy to un answer. Uh, I think start out with something like an L45. L45, you don't have a lot of obstructions and the joint is usually a little bit more mobile. Um, uh, excess is not a problem and then the trajectory is not a problem. Try in those cases whereby stenosis is not too severe, whereby anatomy will be distorted, uh, whereby uh, there may be a higher chance of uh, nerve injury during a test. Uh, and uh, I, I think key is to go slowly, uh, step by step, uh, to ensure that there are no complications. Uh, personally, uh, I, I don't do a lot of MIS delete now because uh, I have uh, substituted it with other uh, techniques. But I think it still is very useful in patients who are uh, obese, uh, where uh, excess may be uh, too much for open surgery. So those patients are, uh, will usually, usually choose an MIS approach, either uh, MIS delete or endolith. How about what case you wouldn't do MIS delete? <laughs> oh, uh, I, I usually don't do MIST leave if, if let's say it's more than uh, two levels and the stenosis is very severe and bilateral uh, because the time taken for, for doing a good clearance is, is a bit too long for me. So I'd rather choose a more straightforward approach. 
So it's more of technical reasons uh, rather than uh, um, a skill set reason. Yeah. Um, okay. Is there a situation that you uh, may need to convert to open? Or you would recommend, uh, I mean, uh, if you don't encounter it before and if uh, someone faces some problem, when do you think that you should convert to open? Yeah. Okay, uh, I, I think if you pace yourself well and you are actually slowly increasing the difficulty level of your surgery, the chance of converting to open is, uh, is, is not high. And the most important reason why people may convert to open is if there is a, a neuro injury or a neuro tear uh, and find it difficult to repair in the MIS approach. So extrusion of nerve fluids is, a, is an absolute indication, I think, for a, a, a open conversion to open surgery. Uh, if you have uh, doubt yourself a little bit too much uh, uh, doing, dealing with a very complex case where you're not ready for it, then of course the chance of converting to open for other reasons is high. Okay, I think Dr. Vishal has a question. Uh, he posted in the chat group. Uh, can we use MIS delay for high grade, uh, grade two stroke three listosis? Uh, if uh, if you can, uh, how is the reduction technique and what are the challenges involved? Yeah, so I think uh, the key to uh, all reduction in orthopedic surgery, uh, spine surgeries, uh, is uh, the amount of release that you get. Because if you don't get enough release, you end up just uh, pulling against uh, something that is stiff. Uh, this results in all the complications like uh, screw pull out and, and, and all of that you can see, you know, and plate the sinking in. So, so enough release is key. Uh, in high grade spondylolisthesis, depends on the stiff or is mobile. If it's mobile, then there is still a good chance that you can do a good job by reducing it. But I find that the translational reduction is easier compared to a, a angular change in the MIC lead because the amount of compression that you get for lordosis uh, realignment is actually a lot weaker than the open technique. So I think key uh, is, a, is the release and uh, in, in very, very stiff ones uh, where uh, I usually uh, in open surgery do a complete 360 release or a, a reduction of this one of the cysts and giving it the least stress possible. Because bear in mind that it's not just the, the reduction that gives it the stress. It, it is also when the patient stands up, walks around the, the uh, stress in the construct uh, as he moves uh, in the next few months time. So do bear in mind that the release is important and if you do not get enough release, there's a lot of intrinsic force within the thing and there's high chance of failure. Uh, so stiff or not stiff, if it's very stiff, then no, I'll do open. If it's uh, high, very mobile, then I, will, I may still do MIST leave uh, uh, in that situation. Okay, I think uh, there are questions from the delegates from O2TV. Um, well, during reduction of listesis, if there's partial pull out of screw, uh, as, hap as usually happen in elderly osteoporotic spine, so what is the salvage uh, in this situation? And uh, how do you determine the optimal amount of force for reduction? Yeah. Okay, so uh, I think again, the first step is to ensure the adequate release. And second step is to ensure your, your screw purchase is extremely good. So I, I recommend routine, long, medialized screws, uh, large, ball, can you let large ball screws to be able to give you the best uh, leverage. But if really, because of that uh, difficulty in reduction, the screw still pulls out, uh, then you're always back to whether it is still possible to put in a larger screw by packing it with more uh, fillings, uh, either bone grass or cement. But usually the strength is not as good. And in those circumstances, I will usually accept a suboptimal reduction. Because if the, the first screw does pull out, the second screw, whatever you augment, it's not going to be as strong and it's going to subject to the same risk. And of course, finally, the last uh, option would be to consider uh, augment fixation. That means going even one more level above to ensure that there's a good purchase to neutralize the force in that segment. But that's the last resort uh, when the doctor acts on what he thinks is the best for the patient. Yeah, just one maybe last question from the audience. Uh, is there any concern on the radiation in this uh, procedure? And uh, if there is, uh, how do you reduce this hazard? Yeah, so uh, if I say concern is radiation to everyone, uh, then uh, uh, one is uh, you definitely have more in MIS they leave. You can avoid it completely and try another technique. Or you can actually try to change the, the amount of radiation uh, that you put in uh, through all those uh, strategies uh, by uh, fine-tuning your, your steps uh, to ensure that it is smoother. If you're more concerned about radiation to the patient, then uh, you can, uh, to, to, sorry, to yourself, 
then you can consider uh, going under navigation. That will also help uh, by reducing the radiation to yourself. So I think uh, MIS techniques, because you are, you are losing the full sight as what you see in open, does have uh, always a higher chance of uh, getting more radiation than, uh, than open surgery. So uh, we have to better in mind and see whether that is still acceptable to us or not. Okay, thank you very much. I think we'll move on to the next speaker. Okay, thanks. Um, the next speaker will be uh, from Professor Jason on oblique lumbar interbody fusion. Uh, Professor Jason, you can start. Uh, can you see my slides? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, thanks for an introduction, and uh, as well for Dennis for uh, actually describing a little bit about uh, OLIFs and lateral uh, inner body fusions, and uh, also talking about some of the uh, uh, screw uh, insertion technique for MIS, which I don't need to cover at all because uh, he's already uh, gone through that comprehensively. So I'll focus on the uh, OLIF technique. Um, okay. So uh, there are a lot of benefits of the uh, lateral inner body. So you heard a lot about the elliptical procedure, but um, it still requires a lot of um, uh, muscle the disruption of the posterior aspect, in which the uh, OLIF does uh, does not require any muscle disruption because you're going through uh, the retroperitoneal plane. So there's a lot of preservation of the posterior structures, and you also have a direct access to the disc space. So you have a more complete discectomy that can be done and better end plate preparation. And of course, the graphs um, are always larger, so you have a greater free bed. Uh, fusion rates have been shown to be larger, and because of the size of the cage and mount jacked up with the disc, uh, you have much better deformity correction as well as the option of uh, performing the indirect compression. Uh, some studies show there's probably a lower risk of adjacent of the as well um, with the full sleeve. And uh, uh, very importantly, you can avoid uh, any uh, entry into the epidural space to avoid nerve root distraction, uh, especially for uh, position surgery. And nowadays, I think a uh, single position surgery is in the trend. Uh, it allows for better efficiency. Um, a lot of people are worried about the anterior structure because, as the also surgery is generally not really trained in this area, but in the lateral distribution position when you're doing the surgery, uh, most of the important vascular surgery or surgery always fall away from you. Of the gravity, and you can have a very nice plane to access the spine. And this is really an MI procedure. So these are uh, patients coming with very nice looking scars after surgery, three level fusion with our very, very minimal scars. Um, so for the final execution, I, I think the main thing to talk about the direct is the pressure to space, of course, we're not going to do a large performance pressure. So uh, let's talk about indirect pressure uh, uh, today. Uh, so how I really manage these patients is really looking for uh, assessing their study first. So patients who are really mechanical symptoms cause patients generally do well with their depression. But if not, if there's rest and kidney or even body deficit, uh, you need to really look at the severity of stenosis that are If uh, there is stenosis, uh, significant stenosis, you should do a, a direct decompression as well. Uh, one other thing I also like to look at but uh, dynamic instability in the spine. So we we'll published on this, uh, showing that uh, on track consumed in film, that there's significant disc height uh, loss uh, with vacuum sign and, and also increase in disc height gain at uh, with track. And these patients need to generally do well with uh, uh, just uh, indirect disc And so this is one such patient will see a significant height gain. And we've had MRIs that are showing you the uh, impressive nature of the indirect decompression. These are pre and post op MRI showing you the amount of uh, now that's uh, regained with just the uh, uh, older procedure. Uh, another case showing you the same thing. So, single position surgery, as I mentioned, uh, really talked about this. I think this is really in the trend now. Um, single position and lateral, you get a versatile approach with uh, both the two admin approaches here. Uh, you do have, <coughs> have the option of being and correction at the same uh, procedure, uh, reduces OT time to uh, avoid the flip. And generally speaking, there's no drawback in terms of line of gain for people. Um, this is really the go to procedure when I think the direct depression is very ergonomic position as well. And you do multi level uh, surgery involving as well as the L5. 
Now, uh, I think um, more recently is a single cone lateral surgery or cone sacral psoas surgery, uh, which I adopt these when uh, patients do need a direct compression or uh, further uh, release at 360 degrees to get a better progress. Um, this is a more natural disease for those who have in the streets. So, in general, again, the vascular is not really a big concern. Uh, and patients have extended heads as well, so is it focused really, so you generally don't have to uh, have that big of an access to, to the source. And most important is simultaneous manipulation. You do a percent release as well as a disc release of the same procedure and get much better for So this is one such case to show you a patient who had a TMS prior that was uh, generally pretty poor uh, reconstruction uh, or doses in the lower segment. Also had a non-union at a three four and a residual stenosis. So you can see this is a, a screw being pulled out at fall up and there's a Jason level problem for the LP. So this patient uh, couldn't have put in any more LP. It's completed a significant bone loss with the uh, screw uh, organ. And so we did a two level overlift uh, at two, three, and three four to regain the uh, for doses uh, for the lung spine. There are some uh, compromises in this procedure. Of uh, course, visualization, uh, not very organized position for the surgeon uh, because of the position you're sitting in. Uh, there's also a problem with the fracture, which you could probably avoid with uh, uh, some, some uh, maneuvers, such as two, including an additional arm, putting some towels on the arm uh, to avoid the trouble. And of course, this procedure does not have access to the Either correct is also a problem for the whole uh, line L45. Generally, do that with stepping uh, over the bed as well as uh, uh, with, which I like to do is uh, doing wind swept uh, positioning of the So, uh, be, given that, I will start my video, uh, which shows uh, a case that I've uh, done previously uh, single position Latin survey, but we just the only focus. So, this is four or five, a slip uh, with uh, some stability and just high gain from. Uh, mainly four or five lab. So, this is a position patient for Kevin. I like to put both on the eyelid press, open up the space. Um, and the uh, first thing you do is, of course, make sure your eye eye uh, is, uh, is able to get a skew AP, as you can see here on the eye eye from as well as back. And it's also going to be that you draw your usual uh, lines, right? So, you find the interior board of your uh, vertical body, three finger press, uh, and three that will be taken. Uh, generally speaking, I like to do uh, multi-human vision because I, I feel a lot of multi level uh, So the first layer you get, of course, is the external feet. Uh, all of these layers you generally don't need any cross dissection. Uh, you just need to uh, the practice those to uh, make the next stage is external feet and the final time. Now, uh, obviously, uh, I've done a lot of these, so I, I generally just do these blindly with. Uh, so, uh, final uh, uh, talk but um, a lot of times uh, if you have heard of these patients, you probably want to have a direct exposure to show the okay. So, now we've already uh, approached the disc, um, and the solace has been retracted away from uh, uh, by the uh, retracted group. Uh, and I will use uh, blunt dissector to expose the uh, annulus. Uh, to get a good exposure uh, uh, of the uh, see here, is repairing the uh, annulus. Uh, my fault and from the right side, you see it's tracking the source again uh, from the plane, and we do our this, uh, this video was taken with uh, a lack of scope, so a little bit different. So, when you're doing this procedure, most of the time, the board such as you start now with. You need to go in two parts. You really need to worry about the box of one of you. Make sure that uh, we're always looking at this with the checking it, this is the rest, um, making sure that we actually dissecting a good amount of this table, or else you will not be able to put it in a large box. Uh, use the top dissector to go through, and generally, and this procedure, there's just an option to cover the end plate. Really go in line with the vertebrae, so this is why it's also a lot of you, as well as two AP elastic, which is crucial. And then you gently tap that top to use the force that far like the annulus, and then you can start moving the side. 
In general, for society, I grew up in so where it's not fit and it's not uh, at any more wiggle room, as I call it, uh, when you're doing the uh, testing the uh, uh, society. So I always used to use these plates, these are for end plate protective plates, which to avoid uh, uh, damage to end plate in the way I can use this. Uh, so this is a seat case, uh, it with uh, uh, the mineralized bone matrix, and again, you can pass it through uh, under the shared body. Uh, uh, generally speaking, these, uh, these surgeries are very minimal blood loss, uh, and uh, uh, quite quickly, we were able to do it uh, properly and have it through. And uh, in indirect decompression, Procedures. I try to take as far from here as possible so that you get a place here, just hiking and uh, subsequent decompression. And then for closure, I generally will uh, do the muscle layers. Uh, generally, the transverse abdominal is just to repair internal and internal ductal deep shift repair, uh, or else uh, you might have a risk of cancer. So uh, that's how we uh, generally do. And then then uh, if I'm doing these by myself at this stage, I will uh, let closure from so my, my, my uh, uh, assistant and then swap the pair to the serial as smooth uh, as uh, Patient doesn't have to move, you just have to that uh, to the side by yourself. And then the pair is the second case. So, um, uh, the ATP or oldest procedure is very powerful tool, minimally invasive technique for lumbar fusion, uh, very strong just high respiration tool with and an option for indirect decompression surgery. With the uh, trend for single position surgery, I think it's very efficient uh, and with good access to L501. And in the phone procedure, you can allow simultaneously to be played, and especially in cases where you need to have perceptual injury or direct position. But always uh, understand your limitations and uh, possible complications that arise uh, through these procedures. Um, if there is a, a, a learning curve, but um, once you've dealt with a good amount of that procedures, the phone procedure is just a, just a, just a step up and uh, not too difficult. To Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, so already there are a few questions in the chat group. So maybe uh, one of, I'll start with one of the questions from the audience. Uh, what is the ideal indication, single level, this disease versus multi-level adult uh, degen scoli? The, they are giving a spectrum. What would you suggest uh, is the ideal indication for this procedure? Uh, that's, a, that's a difficult uh, question to, ask, to answer because I, I would do... Uh, and overlap for both of these conditions. Uh, it's actually a very good indication for uh, multi level adult performing surgery as well, which I didn't cover today, of course, because of the case of uh, course, but um, it's a very good procedure for um, release of severe deformities. Um, it's also a very good procedure for multi level uh, minimal invasive correction of an adult uh, degenerative scoliosis. So uh, it's also a very good option for these cases. Um, <clears throat> rather, if you say an ideal indication to start with, of course, you should do single levels because uh, uh, you do, there is a definitely a learning curve. Uh, so I would definitely suggest the single level uh, this thesis first. Um, definitely uh, do the cases where uh, probably less osteoporotic um, to begin with, uh, because it does take some skill to uh, avoid damaging the end plate. Which you don't want to do at the uh, Maybe I just extend the question a little bit. What would why what would would uh would you not uh, choose olive uh, in what situation? Yeah. Well, um, I think it's a very versatile procedure. Um, there's a couple of uh, concerns I would have definitely when doing the procedure. So. For example, if a patient is osteoporotic, very severely osteoporotic, uh, which you might worry about substance, definitely, uh, and especially in it's a stenotic case, uh, indirect decompression may not be a good idea uh, for these patients. Um, if the access is very difficult and 
don't have an access surgeon or don't even have vascular support, uh, be very careful uh, when assessing the MRI preoperatively if that is a good procedure, especially if you have uh, not much experience doing these procedures. Uh, nowadays, um, I do all my I do all my dissection myself. Um, even if there's a very severely uh, problematic and that vascular anatomy anterior to the 5 1 disc, I can still choose the lateral 5 1 approach. So I wouldn't say that's a complete contraindication. Yeah, maybe this question is somewhat related to the first two questions. Uh, another question from the audience Complications are quite irreversible and devastating as. As is it really beneficial to consider olive when compared to MIC for the same indications? Yeah, and what are the primary advantages over MIC? Look, I think uh, complications can be irreversible, devastating. That's correct, but that is the same for all persons. I wouldn't say an MIC unit is completely uh, risk free. I have seen, uh, well, I, I can say where or who, but. Um, there has been fatalities uh, after a sealant procedure. So I wouldn't say that's completely uh, risk-free. Uh, the main thing is really understand the indication and have proper preparation and experience while embarked on those difficult uh, lateral cases. Um, if if everything is done in proper manner, I wouldn't say all that is really a uh, very risky surgery. Right. Uh, I, I understand, you know, as what all of us are both being said, that's not entertaining, but uh, with experience and, and really following the learning curve, I don't think the older is really that kind of risk. Now, in terms of advantages, there's plenty, right? There are plenty of well published literature, and I think most people who have done both procedures would understand the major advantages of this area. You have a much better release much larger cage, you have better fusion rate, much better correction of segmental or doses. You don't have to touch the drill at all. Uh, all of these will have a significant value to the uh, procedure. And it still is an uh, MIS procedure that you see from uh, the approach that uh, I've shown. Uh, one more, maybe one more question from Professor Yoshi. Uh, what is the pitfall for single position surgery, uh, especially prone position for only? Yeah. yeah, so I, I think that this is a very important question because um, prone position, even to this day, I find uh, are some, you know, many cases with difficult uh, access, um, especially with these cases. So in this procedure, you don't have the proper tools and uh, and ergonomics to actually approach the uh, spine very well in the very obese place. Uh, you have to understand that these are in front position when laterally the access space is very small and the main concern is really uh, the damage in the flexion. So I do still do a uh, floor for these cases and I still do EMG monitoring when I actually access it this space uh, just to make sure I don't uh, damage the lumbar flexion. Now, also in addition is the positional problem with the prone uh, surgery. So your retractor blade will always drop into all the chance to get off, actually inadvertently cutting the ALL, and then you get your case actually a very a lot of difficulty uh, in being inserted. Uh, of course, there's one uh, one company that actually uh, provides you with uh, something to. I, I, I can't, I don't know how much I can say for that, but they provide you something to actually anchor onto the uh, spine so that it avoids that from happening. Uh, but in general, when you're doing this, for, that is probably the biggest uh, uh, limitation that will come. Uh, especially uh, when you're doing these cases, I think the best uh, procedure to do it, the uh, best indicator to do it for is the LP4 first, uh, especially if something like, let's say, revision surgery. That would be a good indication for, for your first presentation. Uh, going down to four or five, it's not right? um, Going up to, let's say, E12, L1, or L1, to the upper, so that four for longer level is also difficult, especially in So I would advise uh, having a good amount of experience with this happening. All right. Thank you, uh, Professor Jason. Uh, uh, thank you very much. So. Uh,
due to time, we will move on to the next uh, speaker. Uh, the next speaker will be uh, Professor Wen Jian Wu, who will be presenting on surgical management of intraoperative incidental duodenal. Good afternoon. My name is Wen Jian Wu from Shanghai Jiujing Hospital. Today, my topic is surgical management of intraoperative incidental uh, duotomy. The incidental duotomy is a very common complication of spine surgery. All spine surgeons may encounter such complication in their careers. The reported prevalence of incidental duotomy can be high, as high as 10% or even more. The risk factors of a dual tear include older patients whose dura may be very thin, OPR patients, and revision surgery. Also, the surgeon's experience plays an important role in the incidental durotomy. Sometimes when you have been go going well for a while and then that you got down, it may occur. Luckily, most patients with a dual tear have no symptoms. Some patients may have positionally, uh, positional headaches or vomiting. Most of all, CSFD can make the wound healing very difficult. For the management of incidental, incidental durotomy, the most important thing is you should not ignore it when it happened. You cannot take chances but deal with them uh, positively. The management mechanism includes stopping the CSF leak by suture closure or augmented closure with a uh, dual substitute material, reducing the subarachnoid uh, fluid pressures, and increasing the ep epidural space pressure. The primary goal of the management is watertight closure, and the gold standard is suture closure. The intraoperative repair of dual tear started by positioning of uh, the patients, uh, positioning of the patients, so that the CSF leak was at the highest point of the surgical site. For example, for lumbar spine surgery, we can raise the head of bed and put the patients at trendable positions. We can also rotate the bed if we need. To, management, um, to manage the dual tear, we need some special instruments, which uh, include some microsurgical instruments. An adjustable uh, section is very useful. A microscope or loop is handy for a magnificent view. In 2015, Dr. Papavero published a, an article and advoca advocated a 10 step protocol for managing intraoperative uh, duotomy. He abbreviated the, uh, this 10 step as bur dub md The protocol is very practical. We can handle the dual tier successfully by following these 10 steps. Let me explain in detail next. First, when the, the incidental duotomy occurred in the surgery, we can remove the bone and surrounding tissues, uh, normally from the, uh, the from the peripher uh, periphery towards the dual tear until we can see the whole dual tear. If the border of the dual, uh, dual defect is not entirely uh, entirely apparent, we should consider enlarging the approach. After bone removal, we can select the dual uh, tear size, shape, and severity to determine the management frame. The next step is intradural loop. For traumatic dural uh, lesions, there may be intradural bone fragment or hematoma. Both should be removed. If there are transected fibers, adaptation uh, should be attempted. Then we can use small cotinoid or a, a low power section with a small hook, nerve hook to uh, report report omega-like extruded fibers. If the dura defect is bigger than 5 mm, 
We can use some collision freeze as an inside patch. The inside patch should be two millimeter larger than the dual gap. The, pr the pressure of the CSF will push the, in the inside patch against the dual to seal the defect. Also, the spinal cord and fibers are protected during the, uh, during the dual closure. Now we can close the dural with a 5-0 to 7-0 proning with interrupted or wrong suture. If access is limited and, the, and hampers at the needle's holder, we can use clips to close the dural. But if the dural clips cannot close the dural tightly, the defect is, can be covered by a synth, uh, synthetic, uh, synthetic like Duragon or official graft. After we close the dural, we can use a hemostatic collagen freeze or fib fibrin grooves at the outside patch overlapping the border of the dural tear. Then we can check the effectiveness, uh, effectiveness of dural to repair with a bowl server maneuver. We can ask the anesthetist to raise the peep to 40 centimeter water and maintain for 30 seconds. If there is no CSF decout, we can say the repair is effective. If all the previous steps have failed, the gentle epidural packing with the muscle tissues will prevent the CSF from spraying into a dead space. The pedicle or the muscle strap should be anchored into the bed depth of the spinal process or to the next available bony structures. Then we can close the incision with a multi-layer closure. This stitches uh, through the bony midline structures further reduce the depth space and the superficial layer are closed by back and forth sutures. If the primary closure of dual tear is not feasible, or we found that the closure of the dual tear is not is too tight, is not tight during the vault server the maneuver. A lumbar, a lumbar CSF and the drainage may be used. Lumbar CSF drainage reduce the CSF pressure and help the, uh, the incision to heal. There is no agreement regarding how long lumbar drainage should be left in space as well as the intensity of the Drainage. As a summary, intraoperative incident to durotomy is not uncommon. We should not ignore it when it happens. Intraoperative management tailored to the specific durotier is the key to prevent a reversion procedure for CSFD. The 10 step protocol BIRD Dove MD is useful and we can borrow to a successful manage the dual tier in the operation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Wu. Yeah, let me see. Uh, okay, there are no questions from the audience yet uh, posted up. So maybe I'll start with a few questions. Uh, do you use uh, any drain uh, for, for uh, patients with uh, dual leak? And if you do, uh, how many drains and what is your drain regime that you use? Uh, yes, uh, this is a great question. And I uh, this is quite controversial. Uh, I think for me, I, uh, I would uh, decide if I put a drain, uh, if uh, for, uh, in, in different situations. If the surgery is not so big, and I think the uh, uh, the bleeding hemostasis is quite good, and maybe I will try not to put uh, not to use the drain. But if the it is a big surgery, it's like the scoliosis or uh, multi level lumbar uh, surgery, maybe I will try. I have to uh, put a, a drain. Uh, but I will. I think first of all, I will try to close the dural tear, uh, uh, if possible. Uh, with the sutures and after that i will uh, use some grooves or patch and uh, and after that i put a uh, drain under the fissures and close the fissure very tight and uh, close uh, also all the, the subcutaneous and uh, close the wound very tight 
and I will uh, uh, leave the uh, drainage uh, maybe for three to four days. And after that, if uh, everything's okay, I will take the drainage out and close the, uh, the wound of the drainage and uh, again uh, with the suture again. Uh, do you switch on the drain immediately uh, or do you keep it clamped for a day or two, uh, then switch on later? Uh, uh, yeah, in a day or two, yeah. Yeah, for the drain. Okay. I think what I did maybe about uh ah oh, number 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 drain. If we cannot uh, uh, repair the that zero, I will. Oh, sorry. Uh, and maybe I will. Uh, of course, I first of all, I, I will not put the uh, drain at uh, uh immediately. But I will uh, maybe uh, observe for one to two days after that. If uh, there are some problems that wound the healing, maybe I would use the drain. Okay. Uh, do you use uh, in, intra uh, dural drains, uh, or is there any situation that we need this kind of drain? Yeah. Uh, if uh, uh, if the dural tear, uh, if the dural tears can uh, not be repaired. And if we, uh, especially when, uh, of course, uh, most of the cases, I will uh, try to close the wound uh, and uh, do not use the lumbar drain uh, after uh, at the surgery. And after surgery, and after surgery, and uh, we will observe one to two days. And after that, well, if there are some uh, swollen of the uh, of the wound, or even uh, or even some leak. The uh, obvious leakage of the of, of the dura uh, tears of SCSF, maybe I will consider or uh, use the lumbar drainage after me one or two, two days later. But if we, uh, in very rare situation, for example, when we met a very big uh, uh, big tears, uh, for example, for the th uh, thoracic uh, uh, posterior th thoracic or, or yellow ligament uh, uh, ossification. And we, we there are a big uh, deficit uh, for the for the dura, and we cannot uh, repair that. Maybe I would I would uh, use the uh, I would put the drainage uh, the lumbar level spine maybe immediately after just after the surgery. Maybe. Okay, there's a question from uh, Doctor Daddy C. Uh, when CSF leaks. Uh, and you well, do well Saba after repair, is it still accurate? Because uh, by the time it is repaired, there is already CSF hypotension. And uh, in his opinion, Basava may not be useful until CSF builds up again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. Maybe sometimes it's not so accurate, but it's still, I think it will tell... Uh, I, uh, I, I have one or two Cases even after uh, uh, such test, maybe uh, there's some problem of the, the CSF leakage. But I think that in most of the cases it works. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wu. So uh, we move on to the next presenter. Thank you. The next presenter will be uh, by Dr. Shai. Ali on uh, a case on degenerative lumbar sclerosis. Uh, Dr. Shahid, your mic is uh, muted. Oh, hello. Uh, can you hear me, everyone? Yes, yes, loud and clear. Yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm going to present a case for discussion, I kept a very simple case. To discuss so uh, as a the, keeping in view the format case discussion regarding degenerative lumbar scoliosis this is the patient uh, uh, six years female presented with predominantly low back pain claudication and kyphotic deformity uh, which you can see in the picture of the patient this is a standing posture of the patient x-rays showed that uh, you know, L2334 L2, uh, degen scoliosis uh, with stenosis uh, we can see in the lateral, X, lateral views of the of the X-ray, the patient in positive sagittal balance of about 14 centimeter or so. 
and then the disks of L2, 3, L3, 4 are kerfotted. Uh, MRI showed uh, uh, significant stenosis at 3, 2, 3, 3, 4, and 4, 5. The patient was generally not fit for anesthesia because of her cardiac conditions. So we planned, uh, which we'll discuss later, the diagnosis was made, degenerative lumbar stenosis with scoliosis with L2, 3, and 3, 4, 4, 5 stenosis with kyphosis. So I'll stop here and ask participants what will be their preferred procedure for this patient. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor Shahid, uh, for the case. Um, maybe uh, I will want to ask one of the panelists, uh, any, do they have any questions or do, you, do they have any comments on this case? Maybe we will start with Dr. Dennis. Uh, um, hi, uh, can I just check, uh, this patient presents mainly with what symptoms? Back pain, leg back pain. pain? Back pain. Back pain. Uh, is there any leg pain as well? Uh, no, claudications only. Just claudication. And uh, she has this difficulty uh, standing straight. She always leans yeah. forward. Yes, uh, That yes. is also a complaint. Yes. Um, I mean, if let's say this patient has uh, substantial leg symptoms more than back symptoms, uh, and it being an elderly lady, I will be keen to do just a decompression surgery. <laughs> but if let's say both symptoms are equal, uh, also with a, a forward lean, um, and then you have gauged this to be uh, probably rigid, uh, because I look at the MRI scan, there seems to be some flexibility in it. So I'm not too sure how much flexibility in the flexion extension view. But if you do feel that this is uh, pretty rigid, uh, then uh, there may be a need for you to also do a deformity correction. Uh, then I would dial in uh, pelvis all the way to uh, thoracic lumbar spine, either T10 or T9. Anyone else? Um... Yeah, yeah I, want, I want to ask a little bit more about that. Yeah, yeah. because um, you know, back pain is uh, always a very difficult thing for us to quantify. Um, a lot of times I want to ask them what is the cause for back pain because, um, you know, in such a case, is the back pain related to the radiculopathy, right? That yeah, could be an option. Is it really posture related uh, with the sagittal imbalance issue? So I think these are things that I would want to know. Um, just like what Dennis mentioned, uh, if this patient is so unfit for any surgery, um, doing a really minimally invasive, like such as endoscopic decompression of that, that level, might already improve uh, the patient's uh, spinal stenosis uh, symptoms. And we know from literature as well as our own experience that these patients with so-called forward sagittal balance uh, might be just postural to relieve the stenotic symptoms. And what after decompression, it might actually uh, regain that uh, line much, much better. Uh, so that that is something to consider. But of course, um, uh, similarly, if this is really a deformity uh, issue, you can see here that the the two lowest levels, which is supposed to be two thirds of the lumbar lordosis and lumbar spine is, is actually essentially neutral, all right? So, uh, I think the entire lumbar spine is uh, is has inadequate uh, lordotic uh, uh, restoration. So uh, for me, definitely a similar to what Dennis mentioned. Um, if she said <laughs> uh, longer fusion would definitely be uh, warranted uh, past the thoracic lumbar junction. So uh, you know, uh, uh, with, with, there's a consensus that whenever there's a mechanical back pain, that the, the patient is not relieved by bending. Uh, the bending post if releases the pain, it, it gives a clear indication that's a stenotic pain. So obviously the patient is not getting relief from the, the, from the bending posture. The patient is in pain, pain in the bending posture. The pain is aggravated on the movements in the bending posture, then the patient remains in the bending posture. You know, in the stenosis, patients get better when they bend, like the uh, blonde mover sign. So this, this, this is the difference. So I'll move on. Uh, we did L2, 3, L3, L3, 4 DLF with MIS, PASF with uh, indirect decompression by the distraction at the L4, 5 and 2, 3, and 3, 4. Uh, this is the picture pictorial view. This has already been discussed in OLE, but this is the DLF. You know, you put the patient in lateral prone position, you put the tubes, then you go to the soils and, you know, you do the, uh, you know, open up the entire desk. I had the pictures of whole, all of the procedure, but you know, I was asked to keep on five, six, seven slides. I just wanted to pop out, uh, pop up the in the minds of participants. So this is the post-op outcome of the thing. 
uh, L2334 DLF uh, nicely restored the cell balance and uh, patient symptom relieved actually. She got she she get better. She got you know significant relief of the symptoms. Yeah, congratulations for the successful surgery. I would like to ask uh, just just ask something. Uh, why do you skip the L two vertebra? Uh, uh, is there any reason? Is cost no, an issue? No, or... no, 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 cost, 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 cost. Right. Because MI screws are quite costly, and in Pakistan, the patient has to bear all all the expensive expenses by by himself. There's not much support from the you know uh, social setup or so. So we have to you know tailor tailor the decision to st stagger the staggering of the screws. We have to do to save the cost. Otherwise, if it may reach, I would have done the deal if above level. But again, because of the cost, I had to stop at L two three three four. I did the deal if at the apex of the deformity. Yeah. Uh, any comments from the panel on this uh, surgery? Well, congratulations on your good result. Um, one other uh, one other thing that I, I've seen that may be helpful, at least in my setting, is um, when you're when you really want to do an MIS and you're not sure if you can actually get away with just a couple of levels, is really to stage it. Um, do first stage multiple level uh, laterals um, to see if actually the lower lumbar are really already can uh, really correct her much well, uh, much better. Uh, and actually, uh, patient may may and may elect to actually go through the second stage depending on their symptom. So uh, again, that's this is really to um, you know warrant how much. Um, how much benefit there is to an indirect decompression, which uh, you've shown in this case uh, to with good patient satisfaction. You know, I, I know that this is not an ideal situation. It, it should have been decompressed because L4-5 was very stenotic. But, you know, we have to, at times, you have to tailor the things according to the available resources like patient health and, you know, everything. So keeping in view of the things, uh, the, the, the patient got significant relief, especially the back pain is, is grossly settled. She's, she's good. Her claudication distance, which was uh, uh, like two to 300 meters, he, she, she has relief of that, those symptoms as well for the time being. But let's see in the future what happens. Yeah, I think most of the back pain uh, is better because you recreated more lower doses and lower down. Uh, that was probably the biggest issue with her preoperative. Yes, yes. Can I ask you a question? Uh, sure. sure. What, if, what is a perfect instance in this patient and the lumbar lordosis? I think uh, uh, lumbar lordosis is uh, much less in after surgery. So we should uh, collect uh, lumbar lordosis in this patient if the perfect instance is much higher in this case. In this case. Uh, so you you are right. Uh, I, I I I appreciate somebody talked about this. Actually, the system available in in our hands is five point five in MIS and five point five. Usually, when we put these are kind of flexible rods. When you uh, put the in, in the screws and you start tightening it, uh, along with the correction of the curve, they start you know straightening of the rod. There's a straightening up of the rod. So that that's what happens. So if there, there would have been cobalt chrome rod or, you know, uh, the 6mm with the NMS, the, 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 that thing would have served up, uh, you know, uh, lordosis things very well. So you, you are right. I, 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 I totally go with you. Yeah. In, uh, in this case, we usually uh, measure the uh, pelvic instance and the lumbar lordosis. That is uh, uh, one theory uh, to collect the... Uh, such a balance. Yes, you are right. You know, uh, uh, the, I, 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 I would, uh, you know, ask the guy that the panelists here, pelvic incidents, and you know, we we all talk about a lot of uh, pelvic incidents and things. I don't know uh, if the thing has to replicate on the OR table by eyeballing. This indicator can never be a good indicator. So I think in the, as far as the lordosis is concerned, you know, the anterior opening of the disc or the contouring of the rod is, is the best thing what we can do. As far as the pelvic incidence, yes, we can calculate after the surgery, 
but during the surgery with this 5.5 system it was you know not uh, not able to correct the low doses to the expected level well you know honestly speaking um i don't think uh mi systems do well to correct uh, sag sagittal alignment um, yes. so um you know, despite that, I think you did create more lordosis at, at the lowest level as compared to pre-op. Um, as I mentioned, pre-op, the 4551 is essentially, you know, straight, right? There's no neutral. There's no lordosis at all. So you did you did recreate something despite um, <laughs> using an MIS technique. So it's probably due to positioning. So luckily, this patient was a little bit more flexible there. But um I, as I mentioned in the q and I think um, the benefit of having a lateral is uh, you do create a lot more lordosis um, and uh, you don't need to rely on your posterior percutaneous instrumentation, which I think is never a good option for uh, recreating sagittal alignment. Yes, the sagittal balance is, is, is very poor, you know, with, with the MIS. It was actually, the, there are two factors. One is you, 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 uh, the, the positional effect. Second is the effect of the, this D-lift, prior D-lift. Actually, that corrected the apex of the deformity. So it helped us to correct the, you know, low doses up and below as well. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the very interactive discussion. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor Shahid, for the interesting case. Um, due to time constraint, we would like to move on to the next uh, speaker. Okay. Uh, the next speaker will be uh, Professor Choi, who will be presenting on cervical laminoplasty. Thank you, Chairman. Today, I will talk cervical laminoplasty for single-level CSM, anterior approach, or multi-level CSM, also approach. Advantage is anterior approach, good relief of neck pain, spine is stabilized with fusion. Also approach, best motionless, Avoid bone graft complications. Laminoplast is ideally suited to rhodotic spine because rhodotis allows to create drip back of spinal cord after the portal laminar arch has been expanded. In developing the opening and the hinges also, generally perform this on the side with great clinical symptoms, although either side can be utilized depending on surgeon preference. Open door laminoplast technique. The opening is created at the RLNS lamina junction by angling the perpendicular to the lamina rather than vertically into the facet joint. The through is completed on the opposite side, leaving the ventral cortex intact. Greenst fractures are created by placing those lateral tension on the spinous process or cut edge of lamina. The ligament plum is put on the tension and cut with capsule lunge. The present meta-analysis shows open, the open door laminoplasty had a higher post-operative JOR score than French door laminoplasty. The two methods had a similar post-operative cervical lordosis and range of motion. In addition, there was no differences in operating time, interoperative blood loss, or perioperative complications. Internal fixation technique. After the laminoplasty has been opened at each level, generally prefer platys due to easy applications as well as immediate stair fixation. Alternate options are sutures, suture anchors, and bone. In foramen tool, technically easier to perform on the opening side. 
This is done after application of internal fixation. Prophylactic pyramidotomy has been advocated as a method of decreasing the rate of post-operative ship by policy. Net pain assault with laminoplasty is often cited as a reason for choosing an alternative procedure. Laminoplasty is not indicated for patients with significant pre-operative neck pain complaint. C5 policy. This complication is not unique to laminoplasty. May occur after any time cervical decompression operation. Fortunately, most patients are able to regain a possible motor function by six or nine months post-operatively. This is laminoplasty cases. 63 male patients had anterior decompression and fusion and anterior stimulation with plate at five years old, but he had a CSM and radar radiograph shows well maintenance of cervical lordosis. CT and the MRI findings show multi-level stenosis and changes of spinal cord. Left side intraoperative finding and stabilizing with suture anchor. POD six months uh, uh, had uh, improvement of CSM symptoms and the radar radio shows well maintenance of cervical lordosis. Postural decompression such as uh, laminectomy or laminoplasty increase range of motion, disc stress, and the passive pulse, and those can lead to instability. Although there is the risk of ASD, postural compression with instrument fusion can stabilize the cervical spine, even for kyphotic alignment. This is laminectomy and the instrument fusion cases. 65 male patients had CSM symptoms. Other large work shows hypothetic cervical spine. CT and MRI finding shows multilevel stenosis and spinal cord changes. Left side intraoperative finding and post op radiograph shows well stabilized with uh, uh, instrument. Therapeutic algorithm in multi-level surgical spondylitic myelopathic diagnosis. The surgical treatment method is make a decision by considering surgical kyphosis and axial leg pain or instability. In summary, laminoplasty is best indicated in cervical myelopathy for patients with multi-level stenosis who have preserved the sagittal alignment and minimal to no axial leg pain related to spondylosis. Generally avoid laminoplasty in patients with significant pre-operative neck pain, kyphotic alignment, and substantial instability. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Choi. Um, I'll start with the first question. Um, if you have a asymmetrical uh, compression of the spinal cord, that means uh, one side is more stenotic than the other side, which side would you choose to open and uh, why? Yeah. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, I'll take the uh, for severe stenosis and uh, side because uh, this side may be related to the symptoms. And so I'd like to open side is uh, uh, 
relate to the symptom side. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, it, may I ask what is the minimal number of uh, levels for laminoplasty that you would consider doing? Yeah, thank you for a nice question. And so the, these days is many surgeons take the laminoplasty with uh, uh, laminectomy or and the anterior instrumentation and the posterior instrumentation combined method. In this case, it's a selected uh, the laminoplast label. But uh, uh, originally, I think, uh, as I mentioned, single or two level, uh, two, single or two level cervical spondyl myelopathy, I'd like to prefer the anterior approach. And so I take, I, I prefer the postal laminoplasty for uh, usually three level, over three level stenosis. Thank you for the answer. Um, maybe another question. What if uh, if your laminal plasty, uh, the the what got thin side breaks? What would you do? Uh, would you change the procedure or you will leave it uh, at ease? Uh, sometimes uh, we we have a hinge side problem. In this case, uh, I just I think it is just uh, I usually uh, I usually perform the post laminoplasty, uh, including usually C six to C uh, three, just over the three levels, just four levels, four four particular levels, and so uh, if the uh, on segment hinge problems. I think uh, no problem, just uh, observation. And uh, after the postal, post operative external support. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, is there any? Okay. So if there's no questions from the audience, thank you very much for the very clear presentation on cervical laminoplasty. So we'll move on thank to you. the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker will be Professor Yoshi, from, who will be presenting on anterior cervical disectomy and fusion. Thank you very much. So, can you can I use video? Yes, you may. Yeah, yes, you may. Yes, yes, you may. Yeah, Jennifer, maybe you can play the video. Yeah. My name is Yoshi Kawaguchi. Today, I'll talk about anterior cervical disectomy and fusion (ACDF). This is my CV. I was a past education chairman of also AP, Spine AP. I have nothing to disclose for my presentation. The indication of SEDF is number one, spinal cord compression at one or two levels. Number two, cervical radiculopathy due to discarniation. This is a case of 40 year old male. He had radiculopathy due to cervical disc herniation at C45 level. This is the best indication for ACDF. Let's look at a video. It takes about three minutes. Color incision is made and platysmal is dissected. We found the medial surface of Stenoclide must reduce, and we will go to anterior surface of the body. Then marker was applied, and X was taken, and we confirm the level. Then we 
apply muscle retraction and Casper pin and dissect me is made. So we apply the microscope and dissect me is going by bar, dion bar, and longju. We check the posterior surface of the vertebral body. We try to find the surface of Dura Mother. The also is, is removed. We can see on the surface of Dura Mother. So dissect me is completed and device applied and fixed by two screws. We use a device since 2015. It is very easy to handle. This 50-year-old male had the operation. The surgical results are very good. Lateral view and AP view. Totally, we performed operation in 59 cases. The surgical results were satisfactory. However, we encountered 21 cases with subsidence of the device, more than 60%. The definition of subsidence is shown here. This is a severe case of subsidence of the device. The inclination of the device was seen during follow-up. Although the subsidence itself is not related to the worst clinical symptoms, the fusion tends to be delayed. This table shows a comparison of the data with or without subsidence. These spaces at pre-off at the last follow-up and pre-off immediate after operation were higher in the subsidence group. This means too much destruction of the disk space has a risk of subsidence. In addition, implant inclination was higher in the subsidence group. 50-year-old male had two levels of fusion. The surgical results were satisfactory, lateral view, and AP view. This case has no subsidence. ACDF with subcut device, it is very easy and safe to handle one or two levels. However, we must pay attention to subsidence of the device. To prevent it, avoid too much distraction and straight insertion of the device are very important. I will briefly talk about anterior surgery for OPLL. 
surgical indication is for myelopathy, not for neck pain. This is a, a surgical strategy for OPLL. In severe spinal cord compression cases, we will perform postural and angle combined surgery. This 49-year-old male had continuous type of OPLL. We performed postural decompression first and then angle decompression was applied. However, this patient had Ricolore, Rico discharge after angle surgery. We performed lumbar drainage for five days. Fortunately, Ricolore was healed. This, in this very severe opioid case, We use ultrasound aspirator to remove OPLL. This is a video. We try to remove OPLL from anteo. Ultrasound aspirator is very effective to remove and very safe. The Judiro OPL was removed by this ultrasound aspirator. We have completed. We confirmed removal of OPLL by intraoperative CD and ACDF was completed in this case. In conclusion, anterior decompression diffusion surgery, safe operation is mandatory. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Yoshi, for the uh, very clear presentation. Uh, I'll start off with a question. Uh, I noticed that you highlighted the subsidence issue in your device. Do you uh, see the same issue with other methods, uh, other ACDF device? Uh, because 63% is quite high. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, uh, definition of the subsidence is very severe. So that's why they found uh, more than 60%. But uh, most of the case, there is no symptoms after subsidence. So we must see the patient uh, with the carefully observation. But uh, right now, we do not have any uh, uh, <clears throat> worst case. How about the... Uh... Do you use any other device for ACTF like a uh, bone graph, uh, allograph, or other uh, plate and cage? Do they, uh, do they have the same kind of subsidence, the same rate? Yeah, I try. Uh, used to use uh, autograft from Area Quest, and uh, in Japan, it's very difficult to use uh, uh, allograft in this, uh, the SDF or other spinal fusion cases. So the, I uh, use autograph mainly. And uh, to use a device, uh, we only take the small piece of autograph from Ilya Crest. That is the uh, advantage, I think. OK. Um, there is a question from the audience. Uh, man, how do you manage uh, CSF leak from anterior cervical surgery during and after surgery? Yeah, that is a very uh, good question. I put uh, fibrin glue and uh, 
the material, uh, what you say, the uh, material to repair the Dura mother. But uh, uh, I show the case after treating uh, these procedures, the CSF leak is still coming. So then uh, in this case, I put uh, lumbar drainage. And uh, fortunately, the uh, uh, <coughs> uh, CSF leak was uh, healed. Yeah, to follow up on that question, um, I noticed that you you can successfully uh, recycle OPLL from the from the front. So, what are the tips to avoid this uh, dura tear during uh, resection of the, or this OPLL? Because uh, it may be quite high risk to get dura tear. Yeah, thank you. That is also the very good question. Uh, if we uh, try to remove OPLL from Andre. Uh, OPL sometimes attached and adhesive to dura mother. So it's very difficult and it's very dangerous. So they, I try to uh, make very thin of OPLL and floating method is much more safer, I think. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Professor Yushi, for the Q&A and the presentation. So, Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we'll move on to the next presenter. Okay, the next presenter is Dr. Amrish Lal, who will be presenting on cervical disc replacement. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Amrish Lal. Thank you very much for having me here. Just to make a case in point, there's this video here which shows post cervical disc replacement. You can see the nice movement of the disc space. So that is the whole purpose of doing a cervical disc arthroplasty. So uh, since this is a basic uh, surgical technique uh, presentation, let's go down to what are the advantages. It gives us cervical disc arthroplasty gives us a nice range of movement at the disc level and also the entire cervical spine. And we do know that it delays adjacent level degeneration that can otherwise happen. It is basically indicated in a young patient with a single or a two level uh, herniation or radiculopathy. Uh, radiculopathy or myelo with radiculopathy or myelopathy. One has to be careful. The planning of a cervical disc arthroplasty starts with assessment of the patient. Make sure that there's no osteoporosis. Osteoporosis can lead to subsidence um, and uh, that can lead to failure of the implant and the whole purpose of uh, doing an arthroplasty. Also make sure that the segment is mobile. It shouldn't be a fused segment. Uh, not only the affected level, but even the levels above, it shouldn't be like an ankylosed spine. Make sure that there is no preoperative deformity. Get standing x-rays, lateral view and AP view. Make sure that it is a balanced cervical spine where there's no kyphosis or scoliosis. And uh, ensure that the spine, uh, that segment which we are replacing with a disc arthroplasty is a stable segment. We don't want undue forces to be acting on the arthroplasty. How do we select an implant? There are a host of implants and uh, you can, uh, in the market, there are limited uh, uh, implants uh, uh, which are available in India. Basically, an implant will have two uh, end plates. It's got a keel to anchor the implant into the bone and it has a joint within which can be a metal on metal or a poly. Here is a case of a 42 year old male with left sided radiculopathy for six months. He came to me with a deficit uh, with a motor power of three by five of uh, wrist extension and the conservative treatment had failed. MRI shows a large single level disc herniation on the left side at the C5, C6 level, which corresponds to the clinical findings. So we go on and plan a cervical disc arthroplasty. Here is a small video to demonstrate the procedure. So it is very important 
to position the patient well. So make sure that there is no, uh, the cervical spine is in neutral position. It, there shouldn't be any hyperlordosis or kyphosis. Make sure that on the lateral view of the image, the facets are well overlapped. They, they have to be, they have to look like one facet joint. And uh, make sure that you have a good visual of the end plates and the level. You cannot do an arthroplasty without being able to see the level on the on the uh, on the lateral view x-ray then you proceed on mark the cricoid process the uh, the thyroid cartilage and the uh, cricoid process and your incision for the c5 c6 level will be in between that but regular transverse incision and then uh, dissect out uh, put a uh, transverse incision on the platysma also to expose the deep cervical fascia do a bloodless dissection uh, medial to the sternomastite, just like the regular uh, Smith-Robinson approach, and uh, identify the disc space, take a check X-ray, and then put on the uh, the Casper pins. At this point, I would like to say that it's very vital that you put the Casper pins right in the center, in the midline. In order to put the pins in the midline, you should have exposed the uh, upper lip of the vertebra well, expose the lateral margins of the disc space and I always do partly do the discectomy so that I can even identify the uncinate process a little bit before I put uh, the anterior part of the uncinate process so that uh, on both sides so that I can put the pins right in the midline. It's important to identify the midline because we need the arthroplasty uh, device to be placed right in the midline. So start the dissection, uh, discectomy, then put in the pins ident after identifying the uncinate processes. And then we go on to do a discectomy. While doing the discectomy, use the curettes to remove the cartilaginous end plates uh, from, the, uh, from the superior and inferior end plates. After doing a good decompression, which is required for relieving the patient of the symptoms, then we bring in the instruments for doing the uh, for doing the disc uh, for for preparing the implants for um, uh, for implantation at this point we use a rasp to prepare the end plates but make sure that the bony end plate is not uh, disturbed it's only the cartilage that you want to remove the sizing of the implant is important the 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 height of the implant has to be such that it is not too tight make sure that the implant size is not more than the disc space below or above whichever is visible the width of the implant also should be as large as possible a wide footprint is good that's what we need to put a large uh, proper size uh, arthroplasty device so it should be from the uncinate process to the uncinate process and uh, the depth of the implant has to be appropriate that it covers the entire span of the uh, end plates but not going uh, you shouldn't need to break the posterior cortex while making the uh, putting inserting the device so you go on to uh, this is how the disc space would appear after you prepare it and then you go on to prepare the uh, the track for the keel you you use the rail preparation device and pass in the initially pass in the pins that is the rail preparation and followed that, following that, you do the rail cutting so that the cut is made in the superior and inferior end plates. Following which, you take the device, you use the device holder and uh, hold the device and safely implant the device in the disc space. Making sure that anteriorly the device is flux, flush with the anterior cortex of the bone and posteriorly make sure that it is not going into the uh, spinal canal. And this is how a good arthroplasty appears after it is done. So when you look at the post-operative x-ray, you can see that here on the lateral view, the implant is well positioned. It's a sufficiently sized implant and uh, it is well centered implant extending from the entire width of the vertebral body. So in conclusion, make sure that the position is perfect and the facets overlap before we start the surgery tape the head 
it is good to maintain uh, tape the head so that the cervical spine doesn't rotate during the procedure uh, process of the surgery don't overlordose the cervical spine find the uncinate pro processes identify them well and then put in the casper pins in the midline so the casper pins become your guide make sure the pins are parallel on the lateral view x-ray and center in the ap view remove the cartilaginous end plates but make sure you pr preserve the bony end plates size appropriately use the largest footprint that is possible for that bone try and match the bone and the size of the implant accurately prepare the track for inserting the implant place the implant perfectly for the end plate in the uh, the depth of the implant should be appropriate at most you can keep it one to two millimeters short of the spinal canal or the posterior cortex don't oversize or undersize the height of the implant if you oversize it then the facet joints above the pressure of the facet joints will increase if you undersize then it may not fit well it may be a loose implant and ensure that your implants are put in a stable segment with good bone quality thank you very much Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abhilal. Um, I'll start with uh, some questions first. Um, uh, uh, can I ask uh, maybe with a simple questions for the audience, uh, what is the advantages of uh, this, uh, this arthroplasty compared to uh, fusion surgery? So the advantage is that uh, uh, it keeps the segment mobile and um, it's a very uh, debatable uh, area but we do see uh, a lot of adjacent level degeneration in after a fusion which um, we have 10 to 15 year studies now which show that the adjacent level degeneration may be less than what it is after an arthroplasty compared to an acdf um, that is the main advantage Otherwise, the rest of it is, uh, uh, you know, the, the process is the same as that of, uh, of an ACDF. Uh, it gives a mobile segment and that, that is in, in itself is the advantage. Yeah. Um, how, how many levels uh, would you do an arthroplasty and do you combine fusion and arthroplasty in different levels? If you do, uh, how do you choose which level to do arthroplasty and which level to fuse them? Right. So I keep my indications for arthroplasty very clear. I do it only as a single level or a two level at the most. I don't go beyond two levels. And uh, I don't combine a fusion and an arthroplasty. I, uh, I do either a fusion or I do an arthroplasty. I keep it. And I try to restrict it to single level as much as possible because I don't know the biomechanics that kicks in. We can't really say what kicks in and loads the arthroplasty device and what is the wear and tear. It is still the wear and tear uh, uh, out uh, the results or effects are still being understood and better devices are being uh, are coming out in the market where uh, the wear debris can be contained and we can contain the osteolysis. So I don't really uh, uh, go combining fusions and uh, arthroplasty. I keep, I've kept it very simple that I do it only for single level or two level disc herniations without a combination. So uh, do you still, yeah, sorry. Yeah, please continue. I don't know if other other uh, surgeons do that, but I prefer to keep it this way, and I, I, I don't disturb the biomechanics that the device is meant for. Uh, do you still do fusion? Uh, and if you do, uh, who 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 does? Well, who would you choose to do fusion, and who would you choose to do arthroplasty? Okay. Um, other than the financial constraints, which is a variety of patients come to us. So um, uh, a patient who can't afford an arthroplasty gets a fusion. Other than that, I would fuse a segment, uh, a person who has a lot of osteophytes at other levels where I'm seeing a pre predominant uh, a tendency towards a fusion. 
say in a 50 year old gentleman who's got larger osteophytes higher up then i think that they have they may be prone towards a, a fusion in the and the arthroplasty may be not so meaningful in them so in such a patient i would do a, a fusion directly um, or if I find that there is some amount of instability, if I do flexion extension views and if there is a little bit of uh, uh, a millimeter of two or of instability at that segment, then I wouldn't do an, uh, do an arthroplasty. I would just go in for a fusion. Um, and OPLLs, I, I wouldn't do uh, an arthroplasty. I would do a fusion. Osteoporotics, I would do a fusion, not an arthroplasty. So my indication for an arthroplasty is very specific that it has to be uh, without osteophyte not too many osteophytes elsewhere in the cervical spine um, and uh, it is a stable single segment or two segments thank you very much for a very clear uh, presentation and a very clear explanation of your indication and techniques thank you very much uh, thank you. Very well uh, presented. Um, we will move on to the next uh, presenter, uh, Dr. Gauraj, who will be presenting on a case for cervical spine. I think your mic is muted, uh, Dr. Gauraj. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I'm just uh, uploading my slide here. Okay. Am I okay? Am I visible? Audible? Yeah, yeah. It's good, good. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you, APSS uh, Online Committee, uh, Education Committee, for having me present a basic uh, case presentation. So this is a very basic case presentation on the topic which has been delivered by the previous speakers on cervical spine pathology and uh, surgical demonstrations. And uh, this was one of the cases which I had done initially when I started off my practice. And there was, though it's very simple, it was, there were many things to learn from this case in those days. And I'm Gaurav, I'm from Nepal, spine trauma. So the clinical history, this is a 45 years general man with pain, actual pain in the neck for the last three months, comes in with diminished hand functions and weakness while using both the hands for the last four weeks. There's difficulty in walking. There's an imbalance. It feels like it's falling down for the last four weeks, and there's altered bladder habits for the last two weeks. So the patient comes with a history of uh, progressive hand weakness and diminished quality of life and uh, uh, functions. On examination, the patient is not able to ambulate independently, and he needs a considerable amount of support to walk. The neck range of motion is restricted, the flexion extensions. The motor power elbow flexion below is three by five bilaterally. Though lower limbs is spastic with increased tone. All the tendon reflexes, deep tendon reflexes are hyperreflexic, except the elbow flexions are diminished bilaterally. The elbow reflexes and brachioradialis is inverted. The Hoffman is positive, abdominal reflexes bilaterally, all quadrants negative, trimestric negative, and the planters are going bilaterally, and sensation diminished C6 below. A dermatome. And uh, if you look at the sorry, just a moment. And if you look at the JOS scores, there's a considerable amount of uh, disability with the upper motor, uh, upper extremity function three, lower extremity motor function three, and sensory diminution to one, and sphincter dysfunction to one. So there's eight on the MJOS score. And these are the images. If you look at the images, the cervical spine, there's loss of cervical lordosis. It's basically a straight spine on both neck flexion, extension, and neutral spines. And there's uh, these, there are degenerative changes. However, the lower uh, cervical spine is not clearly visible due to the elbow. And uh, an uh, cervical spine imaging, MRI imaging was performed in which we can see considerable amount of degenerative changes in the cervical spine with multi-level discs compressing, if, with multi-level discs and effacement of the CSF anterior and posterior to uh, multi-level 
segments in the cervical spine. And also there is a focal area of uh, spot signal changes at the level of C5, C6. And if you look at the other images of the parasitical images also, you can see multi-level discs compressing, uh, aborting the cervical spot. The most prominent is the C5, C6, and also there is the C6, C7 with uh, end plate changes, edematous change, end plate signal changes of a C6, C7. In the axial sections, uh, there is similar picture in the axial sections with uh, with CSF effacement due to the disc osteophyte complex, and also there is neuroforaminal stenosis in multi levels. A CT scan was also performed in this patient, in which, uh, as Dr. Amrit Lal had just spoken previously, you need to look out for these any osteophytes in the posteriorly, so you can we can visualize the osteophytes in the C5, C6, and also C6, C7 segments, and with diminished. Uh, disc spaces. However, there is no focal OPLL or no continuous OPLL as uh, described by Professor Yoshi in the previous lecture. So this is a 45 years young gentleman with progressive weakness of both upper and lower limbs with altered blood habits. So there's a degenerative compressive myelopathic changes with focal cord changes at C5, C6 level with maximum compression. However, it's a multi-level uh, this osteophyte complex pathology compressing the core. So this is the case presentation, and I would like to open the floor for discussion. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Garaj, for a very uh, clear presentation. Uh, is there anyone who wants to make a comment or ask any questions? Uh, maybe we will uh, uh, start with uh, Dr. Professor Choi. Do you have any comments or? Yes. Uh, this uh, 45 gentleman, uh, he had a, a spondylotic myelopathy basis, and the sterus level is C3456. C3, I think major, mainly mainly uh, C5, 6 levels. And so I think it is uh, three level, uh, over three level compression and uh, uh, changes of spinal cord uh, signal. And so uh, I, I think in this case, uh, uh, postural laminoplasty or uh, postural laminectomy and uh, instrument fusion. And so in the past, uh, I, 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 um, uh, in this case, uh, maybe cervical sagittal valence is uh, almost neutral or kyphotic angles, I think. And so uh, in this case, uh, also, I'd like to, uh, to treat it with uh, uh, postural laminoplasty. And in the past, I, I can I could do it. But so recently, I'll take the uh, treatment method, uh, uh, postural laminectomy or C three four five six three levels, uh, five six three levels, and and uh, six seven seven segment is don uh, laminectomy, and for preventing spinal cord pinching. And so, uh, postural lateral mass instrument, instrumentation and the postural fusion. I think, uh, uh, in in summary, I I'd like to take the postural laminectomy and the instrument fusion. Thank you. Thank you very much for the comment, Professor Choi. Uh, maybe Professor Yoshi, do you have any comments? Yeah, thank you very much. I think in this case, I will do the laminoplasty only uh, because uh, the, the patient has a uh, marginal spinal cord uh, compression and also the alignment is also bad, the not kyphotic. So that I think uh, laminoplasty is the best indication in this case. Maybe this patient has a uh, development to narrow spinal canal. So that's why the laminoplasty is a good indication. That is my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yoshi. Uh, Dr. Amrit Pal, 
Yeah, so, yes, yeah. absolutely. So um, uh, if I got it right, the patient also has um, a significant, uh, some amount of bladder involvement. So my priority, uh, my, I would be interested in getting a good canal clearance. I saw that there's a large disc at the C5, uh, C6 level. And uh, even the C6, 7 level was uh, quite significant. So I would do a two level ACDF in front complete the, the do a complete discectomy and uh, canal clearance there and then flip the and and fuse the level with a uh, with a, with a cage and screws at two levels at c56 and c67 and uh, then i would flip the patient and do a, a, a posterior laminectomy with a lateral mass fixation from c3 to c7 because I see that there is some amount of kyphosis and there's potential for maybe an adjacent level degeneration in the future. So I would do a laminectomy and a lateral mass fixation C3 to C7. That would be my plan for this patient. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a, a variety of uh, uh, suggestions from all three panels, which is very interesting. So maybe uh, Dr. Gauraj, uh, you yeah. want to show us what you have done? Okay, so for me, what I did was that since uh, the maximum compression, if you see the maximum compression is at this uh, the lower level, there's a huge disc and there is also a focal CSF, so quad signal changes there. And also the C6, C7 level, also there is, uh, there is a good amount of compression. So what I did for me, this was the pathological level. And I did counsel the patient that initially I am going to do an ACDF, as Amit Lal said, the ACDF two levels. And if the patient improves, I will not do a posterior. But if the patient does not improve, does not have significant problems, then I would do a posterior surgery also. I would stage it and keep some time duration in between the two surgeries. So what I did was that I went ahead and I did a two level ACDF did a good decompression, did a two-level ECDF, uh, and then observed the patient. Fortunately, the patients, all the, uh, the bladders, uh, the, most of the symptoms started dissolving, and the patient started ambulating also. And it's been around uh, three to, uh, it's been around four years now. The patient has significantly improved. However, the majority of the hand function at C5, C6 level has not uh, returned back. Maybe that is due to the myelopathic changes in the cord. So this is what I did it. And I've still not uh, done the posterior surgery till now. Uh, congratulations for the successful surgery. Um, may I ask the panel, do you have any comments on uh, what was done? Yeah. Professor Choi, any comments? Mm, uh, did you have uh, any further evaluation post-operative? Uh, such as uh, uh, CT or MRI check post operative. Okay. So, this is, I don't have an MRI scan, but this is the post operative CT scans. The images I have. I think uh, in this case, uh, please check the adjacent segment uh, problem. In your parlor, please. Adjacent? Adjacent segment problem. Yes, this, uh, even uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yes, please. Yeah, but what I can uh, appreciate from these post operative CT scans is that the osteophytes also, a majority of the osteophytes have dissolved also. And there is a good canal clearance at the two levels where there was maximum compression. What do you say, Amrit? Dr. Amrit? Yeah, so um, uh, nice uh, restoration of the uh, lordosis at that level. But I'm a little concerned about the C3-4 level for the future. But yeah, four years is a good time to, you know, it stabilized. Hopefully some osteophytes form there and it will naturally stabilize. I was looking at uh, C6-7 also. I felt that that uh, level was uh, quite uh, stenotic. Uh, so... I would be looking at even those levels. Probably 
other hand functions uh, anything to do with that is what is going on uh, what i'm thinking maybe uh, an mri to look at the c67 and see if there is significant compression then do a fusion there also even there so that you can probably hope yeah. through the hand function if if it's possible uh, dr yoshi any comments yes thank you uh, as uh, dr amithar said uh, i will uh, uh, you must check the uh, c c4 level in future the maybe adjacent segment disease might occur in this case and also i will have a comment about the plate the thick of plate the the thickness of plate the thickness of plate is relatively uh, very uh not thin very large so i'm afraid uh, the uh, injury of uh, the asparagus mm -hmm. uh, is maybe related to the thick plate so check the uh, the thickness of the plate that is yeah. my comment yeah maybe if i had those beautiful implants which you are using i could have used it here <laughs> <laughs> thank you anyway congratulations for the like, nice cases yeah this was an excellent learning case for me maybe looking back retrospectively now if i had done anything uh, differently maybe i would have just done a laminoplasty or a cervical laminectomy and instrumented fusion all from the back now maybe yeah as you said uh, laminoplasty is a second choice in this case mm -hmm. yeah. yeah okay thank you very much dr garage and uh, thank you. i think uh, we are on time very and all the speakers are keeping their time very, very well. Yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, so before we end, I think the Secretariat has uh, some uh, announcement. Yeah. Or oh, I do my closing first. Oh, yeah. So uh, thank you very much uh, to, okay. All right. So uh, we are, here also to try to uh, in this uh, short time to try to uh, 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 let everyone know about our EPSS mission and also our membership and uh, currently we have a total number of 561 members from 26 countries and is uh, growing every year and we would like to encourage uh, everyone uh, those who are not members yet to join APSS and join our community as uh, we are a community that uh, promote uh, education in spine surgery in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, these are the, all the privileges that you get. You can easily go to our website and look into all these uh, privileges uh, more in more detail. And you can also check uh, what is our previous activities in uh, uh, for APSS. All right, uh, this uh, roughly is a fee structure. Um, if you can, we would encourage you to join our live membership. But if not, uh, we have a yearly subscription as well. So please join APSS. Okay, thank you, uh, the Secretariat. So uh, I would like to close this webinar and I would like to thank uh, every speaker for their great contribution to the webinar uh, because your experience in this field does matter to our education and our advancement and our knowledge in this uh, fraternity of spine surgery. So I think your contribution is very, very great and uh, it's just an honor for us uh, from the APSS uh, educational community to have you in our webinar. So thank you very much again. Yeah, maybe uh, Professor Kwan, do you have any other closing comments if you want to uh, say to the speakers and the panel? Um, yes. Um, yes. Uh, thanks, uh, Kiki. Um, thanks to the participant. All right. 
for staying up all right, to attend this webinar. And thanks to all the speakers here um, from all different countries. Uh, the composition of the street speakers are really true Asia from all the different, different sectors of Asia Pacific. Thank you again to all the speakers. And finally, thanks to the online committee, uh, Vishal, Kaylin, and Auto, Auto TV for making this a successful event. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. See you. Have a good weekend or yes. the half last part of the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. 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 Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, and have a good weekend. Bye. Bye, thank you.